Bibles and um, have them ready. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4 is where we're going we're gonna to camp tonight. I just want to thank Dr. Harmon and uh, you for this opportunity to share the Word of God and to bring forth the Word of God. It is a privilege. And uh, I am so thankful that I've been able to be here at Grace and uh, under Dr. Johnson's ministry and then now under Pastor or Dr. Harmon's ministry. And uh, it's truly a blessing. And my wife and I are truly blessed. We get to be with the teenagers and uh, are truly blessed by them. And they are a great group of young people. The title of my sermon or message today is going to be Living the Resurrected Life Now. I thought how appropriate that last week we had Easter and we focused on the resurrection of Christ. But then now today we're going to focus on our own resurrection. And it's not because of ourselves, but because of Jesus Christ. So living the resurrected life now. Let's have a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that you've allotted for us to come and to hear the preaching and the teaching of the word of God. We're such a gracious God. We thank you for the service we had this morning. We pray that, Father, as, I, as these lips of clay and I begin to preach the Word of God, I pray that you would make the Word of God clear. Hide me behind the cross. Give me a fresh anointing from you. And, Father, uh, let your Spirit move among us that it would be very clear what the intent of your Word is. Father, we do want to pray for our dear pastor and ask you will bless him. And uh, Mrs. Harmon, is there a way? And give them a, a time of refreshment with their son. Father, we also want to just pray for the Brown family at the loss of several of their family members and pray for comfort. And all those that are on the bed of affliction, touch them and heal them. Lord, we'd also like to pray for maybe someone here uh, that is sitting amongst us that does not know Christ as their Savior. May today be the day of salvation for them. And we love you and we thank you and we praise you and give the honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I thought it'd be interesting if we start out with a picture uh, of what I call then and now. Uh, To the left there, you'll see uh, my wife and I when we first got here in 96. I think this was actually a picture taken the first Christmas we were here. And it was over there on the steps with the poinsettias. And and, uh, you can see a couple of things. First of all, my wife just gets better looking with time. She, she, she just gets more and more beautiful as time goes. But the guy next to her, uh, it's a little bit different. Uh, he's, he's lost a lot of hair. And uh, he's lost a hair up here, and then he's grown hair down here. And uh, we're so thankful to be here again at Grace and, and growing up Grace. I, I remind my kids all the time that they've had the privilege of being here at Grace and growing up at Grace. And so we're thankful for that. And it's a blessing. Well, let's turn to the Word of God in Colossians chapter 3. I'm going to read the verses. I think they'll be projected behind me. But in chapter 3, verses 1 all the way to 4. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affections on the things above, not on the things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. You know, as we think about and reflect on this passage of scripture, we sing a song uh, right from the beginning. We teach it to the children, seek ye first. And it's a biblical song. It comes right out of Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I like the statement that D.L. Moody made, and that is, You're so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Now, I must confess, when I first heard that statement, I I took umbrage with it. I was offended by it. I mean, what do you mean I'm, I'm no earthly good? But I've come to recognize that that's what a true believer should be. Yes, we're in this world, but we're not of this world. And we are so heavenly minded because our affections are in heaven. Our love is in heaven. You see, he didn't mean it in a negative sense, but that the world doesn't quite get it. You know, you and I are peculiar. We're strange. We're different. And you know what? You and I need to become comfortable with that. Comfortable with being peculiar, strange. You see, what we believe affects our behavior. The truth of the resurrection will affect us in the future, but it's also a present truth. The resurrection power has affected us in how we live. And so as Paul dives into this incredible book, or as we dive into this incredible book, I want you to see a couple things 
before we get to our passage. And the first is the city of Colossae itself. You know, someone once said that the city of Colossae was a second-rate town with a first-rate Savior. Colossians chapter 4, verse 13 says this. It says, For I bear him record that he hath great zeal for you, and them that are in Laodicea, and them that are in Heropolis. You see, Colossae sit right in the middle of the trifecta of cities. There was Laodicea, there was Colossae, and then there was Heropolis. But unfortunately, due to economic struggles, Colossae began to decay. It began to fall into ruin. So yes, many people and historians believe that it was a second-rate town. But even though it was a second-rate town, it had a first-rate savior. And this church at Colossae began to have a reputation that was known not only in Colossae, but all around the world. Oh, that grace would be that type of place. Oh, that we would start in Catonsville and then move to Baltimore County and Maryland and all around the world. Isn't it exciting what God is doing through the Ever Living Story, Uplift TV, through several of our media devices and platforms? It's exciting. The gospel is getting out. Well, in this small little church, we see not only do they have some tremendous reputation, but they've also got some tremendous challenges. And we'll get to those in a minute. But the city of Classy was a tremendous testimony for the Lord. But then we not only see the city of Colossae, but the correspondence of Colossae. We know that Paul is the author under the inspiration of God. And he wrote this prison epistle from Rome. But here's the deal. He's never been to Colossae. In fact, the only way he knows Colossae is by its reputation. And there was a man by the name of Epaphras, if you take your Bibles and look in Colossians chapter 1, verse 7, Paul gives a really good testimony of this servant from Colossae, Epaphras. And it says in verse 7, As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. So Epaphras was this type of guy that he went to the church of Colossae, not because he had to, but because he wanted to. This is the type of gentleman, this Epaphras, that if he was on a media platform and anything came across Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, he was always sharing. Oh, he was so in to what was going on in that small little church at Colossae. And as a result, the reputation of being a godly church filled with godly people, because you know, it's just not the steeple, the door, but it's open up and there's all the people. It's the people that make the church. And this church had a passion for Jesus Christ. But unfortunately, there was some false doctrine that began to ooze into the church. You know what I'm talking about. And it could happen to any church. You know, you're driving down the road. And there you look off to the right and you see the title of this church. And it's the first Baptist church of the Methodist Lutheran, a Pentecostal um, first savior of the living water. And you're like, whoa, what do they believe? And you're looking at that. And then you have other churches that say mosaic, rooted, new life. And you're like, well, what are what they believe? You know, it's becoming harder and harder in the day and culture that we live in to really know by the title of the name of a church what they stand for. But I can tell you one thing that we can all agree on. The one thing that's going to separate the true church from a false church is what they do with Jesus Christ. You see, because Paul makes this point later on in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. You are complete in Christ, lacking nothing. And that's exciting. In other words, if you go to a church and they say, well, you need Christ and Christ and. Well, that right there is a warning light about that church. If they say, well, you know what? We have extra biblical text. Mm -mm. It's the word of God. You and I know this, but you know what? There's many churches out there that have strayed from this. They've become program driven instead of a person driven. And the person is Jesus Christ. We want to be all in for Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul was. That's what Epaphras was. And that's what this congregation at Colossae was. And I know that's what this congregation here at Grace is all about. But as we go and dig a little deeper, we know that there were some 
false doctrine that was beginning like the blob that oozed into the church. And the first one was Gnosticism. What is Gnosticism? Well, it's knowledgeism. Remember, the Greeks seek after wisdom. The Greek taught, taught that knowledge was the key to heaven, an attitude of religious snobbery. It really didn't matter how you live, they thought. They were so enamored with Greek philosophies, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, just to name a few. It says in chapter 2, verse 8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophies and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. You see, the Gnostics believed that anything material was sinful. And so they could not reconcile how Jesus, God's Son, could come to this earth and live while having flesh. Because they believed the flesh was bad. But we know Jesus Christ took on flesh, that kenosis passage, fully God and fully man in one person. And how incredible that is. Paul shares with that in Philippians chapter 2. And they couldn't believe it. And so Paul has to set them straight. And in chapter 1, he does set them straight. Several arguments. But then we not only see the Gnostics, but we see the Judaizers. The Jews sought to bring Christians back under the law of Moses. Listen to what it says in chapter 2, verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of holy days or of the new moon or of the Sabbath day, that which is a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. You see, they were a monastic group who believed in depriving the flesh to enhance the spirit. Their life was a system of don'ts. There's never been a law that they didn't like. Sometimes they would even went as far as mutilation. Listen to what it says in Colossians 2, 20 to 23. And it says, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all perish with the using, after the commandments of the doctrine of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship and humility and the neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. So we see that this is what Paul and this is what um, Epaphras and this is what the church of Colossians has to deal with. And if we're not careful, it's what we also have to deal with as believers in our own lives. Because there's a lot of cults and isms and schisms. I'll tell you, I have really enjoyed this theology class on Friday at 6 a.m. It's been great. And listen, theology is not something that's in a Baptist Bible college in the back rooms and all stuffy and pe- It's not. The new evangelism is apologetics. And you need to know, and I need to know, what we believe so that we can give an answer. We've got to know what we believe so we can behave in a way that honors the Lord. And so coming to the correspondence, we see Paul is writing this letter to combat some of this false doctrine and show that Christ is God's son. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. You see, the first chapter stresses doctrine in Colossians, Christ's deity, his sufficiency, and his preeminence. The second chapter stretches persuasive arguments about Christ's fullness and warning his hearers about being taken captive by false teachers. The third chapter stresses practical spiritual living as an individual, servant, master, family. And the fourth chapter stresses prayer for others to walk straight and to be always ready to give an answer. As we move a little further, further, we see in chapters 2, verses 18 to 23, Paul just finished warning the church that there were men that was desiring to beguile, charm, cheat, deceive them out of their heavenly reward. And present blessings by by confining and restricting them to dead forms, ceremonies, rituals, and regulations. All of these ideas are like furniture in a mausoleum. There's something better for the one who has been raised unto the newness of life in Christ. You see, a tomb is a proper place. Excuse me. A tomb is not a proper place for a living man. So when we were quickened. That means made alive in Christ, which we didn't do ourselves. That was all by the grace of God. The things of sin and of this world became almost like a catacomb where we find no more home in. 
We must leave the tomb of external religion, leave the vault of carnal enjoyments, and rise out of the coffin of rituals. You see, the one born in Christ cannot rest in the dead things of this world, but now has a newness in life that is tethered to the resurrection of Christ. Here's what Spurgeon said, and I like it. He says, that which is not of the living Lord is a mere piece of uh, funeral pomp fit for the cemeteries of formalists whose whole religion is a shoveling of dust on the coffin lid. Wow. As we think about this, do you? Do you enjoy your Christianity? Do you act like you enjoy your Christianity? I mean, are are you kind of sour grapes? Got to go to church again. Get in the car, Sue. All right, kids. Now we get in there, you know, let's put on a happy face. Here we go. Hey, how you doing? Yeah. You, are you enjoying it? It's, it's meant to be enjoyed. And that, the reason by, the reason is because, yes, we live in the world, but we're not of the world. Our relationship is tethered to Christ, and he's risen from the grave. So let me give you three points that are going to help us understand this out of Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. And the first is the realization of resurrection with Christ now. The realization of the resurrection with Christ now. You see, the things of this world and sin become a tomb to us. Look what it says there. If then you be risen with Christ. You see, a coffin is a good rest bed for a dead body. But when the dead man lives, which you and I were, we were uh, really dead in our sins and trespasses, and then Christ made us alive, Okay, we, we didn't come alive ourselves. <laughs> Dead things can't live. Christ called us. Christ quickened us. And as a result of that, God made us alive unto him. We were objects of wrath. Satan was our father. We were of most men mi- miserable. In theology, we call it the total depravity of men. It's like the limbo. How low can you go? How low? It's low. The sinfulness of man. And we know that there's common grace out there, and we know that there's philanthropists that do great things and give great money. But I'm talking in respect to a holy and a righteous God. Listen to what Colossians 2.20 says. It says, wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of this world. Now, look at Colossians chapter 3, because they kind of ask the same question. In 20, it says, wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world. And then it says in Colossians 3.1, if ye then be risen with Christ. In other words, Paul is making a statement, and he's saying, if this statement is true, then, then, he's kind of building a bridge, an idea that's going to help us all walk over. And what is that? Well, as we see, Colossians 2.12 said, and this is awesome, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. You know, uh, this is just kind of giving doctrinal context to now the behavior that Paul's asking them to live out in this world. And as we're, li- we're trying to live out as well. Look what it, listen to what Ephesians 6, uh, 2, 6 says. And hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You see, the paradoxical question you're probably asking yourself is, don't I have to die physically before I can reach the next life? And the answer is just confusing, yes and no. In other words, here's what I'm talking about. We have to understand that everything has changed in our life. The goals, the aspirations, the desires. Peter says that because of this faith in Jesus Christ, we've become pilgrims, strangers, sojourners. Again, we just don't fit in. That's what 1 Peter 2.11 says. Yes, our physical residency is on earth, but our home is in heaven. Our home is in heaven. Our heart is in heaven. We, we desire to be with him. Listen to what Philippians 3.20 says. For our conversation, lifestyle, is in heaven, from whence we also look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, again, just reminding of that simple truth, in the world, not of the world. So we have, we are to hasten to leave every sinful pursuit as our Lord hastens to leave the tomb. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. So again, looking at a 
a tremendous passage of Scripture. Paul links this together here, and he says about the incredible process that has happened in our life. You know it, Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. But also in Romans 6, 3 and 4, know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, if we are buried by him in baptism, it isn't, aren't baptisms beautiful? We had one recently. Aren't baptisms all about life? They're not about death. Although there has been a process of dying in our life. But aren't you, aren't you glad we don't have death baptisms? You know, someone's going, you want to get baptized? Sure, come on, let's go up in the tank. Okay. Take him down. No, he can't let you up. No, he can't let you up. Jesus never rose. No, it's, a, it's, a, it's an outward illustration of what has gone on in the heart, in the life, in the newness of life. And that person goes down and they're like, man, I want to come up. And they come up. It's a connection that we share with Christ. And there's a newness of life. It's a beautiful picture that of the process that is going on in our lives. And so the new man seeks things above. What, what am I seeking above? Am I seeking clouds and, and stars? No, it's Christ. We're seeking Christ. Not just to look in a direction, but because he is there. That's our desire is to live for him. Listen, and, and Pastor Earl referenced this, and it's such a beautiful passage in Romans 8, 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? Ephesians 1, 20, which we wrought in Christ when, we, when he raised him from the dead and set him at the right hand in the heavenly places. You see, the mark of a genuine born-again believer is to leave his past pleasures, enjoyments, friends, places, everything. Why? Because of the spiritual process that has happened in his life. And it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. The mark of a new creature is the desire for holiness, purity, and service unto him. Really, what we become is kind of like astronauts. Yeah, each Christian is an astronaut in the truest sense, living on the earth, but always continually gazing to the stars. And for the believer, we're constantly gazing towards heaven. So there's the realization of the resurrection with Christ, but also the recognition of the ascension with Christ now. Well, Christ ascended to the right hand of God. This is where every dedicated disciple wished to sit. Remember those disciples that were wished with Jesus? They almost got into a fight, wanting to sit next to Jesus, wanting to be next to Jesus. Jesus didn't condemn them for their desires. He condemned them for their timing. You know, it's, it's a beautiful picture when you think about God and Jesus seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And let me tell you why. Because in the tabernacle, if you'll remember, which was the sacrificial system for the Jews uh, in the Old Testament, the Jews were constantly bringing the sacrifice. Do you know in the tabernacle there was not a chair for sitting down? Do you know why? Because the sacrifices were never over. The blood of bulls and goats, they could only cover. They could not take the sin away. But Jesus sat at the right hand of the throne of God. Why? Because when he said it was finished, it wasn't covered, it was taken away. And we have the victory in Jesus. Oh, I don't know about you, I'm getting a little excited here. Monday's not looking so hard. Because I know who's going to be on Monday. Well, Tuesday's another man. No, Tuesday. But we know Jesus is sitting right down. And when he sat down, it is finished. That sacrifice, high pox, once for past, present, and future. You and I are forgiven. Isn't that beautiful? I don't love you, Savior. Yeah, but you don't know my past. Don't need to. He'll take care of you. You know what? I'm reminded. I was just reading this verse the other day. It's found in the book of of Proverbs, Proverbs, such wisdom literature. Proverbs 28, 31, 13, 28, 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth, forsaketh them, shall have mercy. 
Proverbs 28, 13. Confess it and forsake it. He will give you mercy. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I remember as a little kid, I went to a Methodist church. My mom and dad were seeking God. And, and as they were seeking God, and, and God was doing a great work, at least in my dad's life. And my mom was kind of like, I don't know what's going on. And we were like, what's going on? And so I remember this guy gave us a little talk when we were in this church. And he gave us this, he gave us this pencil about this big. And on the end of that pencil, he gave us, and the eraser was this big. You know, I want to say something. There's forgiveness in Christ. No matter your past, no matter what you've been through, today could be a new day. Confess, forsake, he will give you mercy. So Jesus is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He is seated because his sacrifice was sufficient. Listen to what Psalm 110 verse 1 says. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I will make thy enemies thy footstool. Luke twenty two sixty nine 69 says, hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. You know, you can experience this now, this victory. Seek heavenly grace now, faith, love, zeal. Seek heavenly joy now, the peace of heaven, the rest of heaven, the service of heaven, the holiness of heaven. You see, Christ ascended where our affections must be. You know, I really, every once in a while, my wife has to go. She has to go to various conferences in different places. You know, the women's retreat. Thank you, ladies, forever does the women's retreat. That is such a blessing to my wife. It's a blessing to me. Okay, it's a blessing to my family. Thank you for doing that. These little ministries, it's, it's wonderful. But when she goes, I, I must confess, you know, uh, my love goes with her. Okay, when I leave, my love stays with her. I don't know if you know this, but uh, I love being a guy. I do. I love being a male. I do. I used to be a male in a female body, and then I was born. But I love being a, a, a male. I do. I love, I love being a male. And it's not that I hate females. I don't. I married one. And I love her very much. But it's just, you know what? I love being a male because to not love what God has given me would be an attack on his sovereignty. And it doesn't really matter what I feel. It matters what he has done. But whether she leaves or whether she stays or whether she goes, I love here. And you know what? Just because Jesus is seated at the right hand of the throne of God doesn't mean my affections diminish for him. My affections are even more for him. You see, this verse, as we talk about this idea of affections, it means to literally think or have the inner disposition. Listen to what Romans 8, 5 says. For they that are of the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are of the spirit, the things of the spirit. What to see, what someone believes, just watch their behavior. Listen to what Philippians 3, 19 says. Whose end is their destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is the shame, and their, they mind earthly things. The contrast is huge. The chasm is wide between heaven and earth. Abhor that which is evil, cling to that which is good. Romans 12 the two says, we've got to make sure that we're having the right thoughts and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Philippians 4, 8 says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. You know, when we were younger, we said, my mind wandered for a minute. <laughs> Where'd it go? I don't know. It's still out there. <laughs> Wandering mind. In high school, I remember they put us in this room and they had this little candle. It's called peer leadership. And they were, and they were like, okay, now listen, here's what we want to do. And, and, and by the way, in high school, and, and, and you're in a group, a room full of kids, and they turn down the lights, you get, whoa, well, what's, what's going on here? And they said, okay. I want you to focus on the candle. As you focus on the candle, release your thoughts. And I'm, release my thoughts? I'm not going to release my thoughts. I have enough problems with my thoughts. I, I need to make sure that my thoughts are intentional. And you know what I'm talking about. Again, Pastor Earl covered this morning. You're walking along, singing a song. You got your own theme music in your mind. Monday morning's coming along. You're like, man, I'm going to hit it. You got your cup of coffee, keys, you're ready to go. And all of a sudden, a thought, you stink. You're not good enough. You're going to fail today. 
And these thoughts start coming to you, and, and, and you have to be intentional with your thinking and begin to assault your mind. Repeat scripture over and over and over. Get an app, read a scripture over and over and lock it into your thinking. Here's what Romans 6, 2 says. God forbid, how should we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? The realization of the resurrection, the recognition of the ascension of Jesus Christ. But then also, finally, we see the revelation and glorification with Christ now. So turning back to Colossians chapter 3, verses 1, it says, Set your affections on the things above, not on the things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Look at verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. See, a glorified Christ is our life now. We are his now, but it does not appear what we shall be. We are experiencing his life now, but it's only poorly sensed, isn't it? We're like an acorn with the potential of being a mighty oak. We're like a tadpole with the potential of leaving the... Sw- now, that, that illustration doesn't work. No one wants to be a tadpole. Let's go on from that. We're like a caterpillar in a chrysalis that has the potential of becoming a beautiful butterfly. You see, we have a heart within too big for our chest, a spark of divine life intended to burn on the altar, on the heaven's altars. The glorified Christ shall appear. You know what it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel. And the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive shall be caught up to meet him in the air, in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Then like an acorn, we shall realize our potential and spread our branches and display our leaves. Then, like a frog, we will hop out of the swamp. No, never mind. That one that doesn't work. But then, like a caterpillar, we will be free from the prison and we'll be able to soar to greater heights. It's a release. The glorified Christ shall share his glory with us. 1 John 3 2 says this Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know. That when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. You know what? Because we'll step into this portal of heaven and our faith will turn into sight. The myriads of angelic hosts will never share the glory as those who have been blood washed. The vast universe will never share his glory as those that have been blood bought. Oh, my friend, are you sitting out there today and you don't know the greatness of who Jesus Christ is? Let me just remind you, you and I are sinners. We're broken. But come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Let him bring you. Let him make you whole. Let him make you a trophy of grace. And he did that through the death, burial, and resurrection. We have a living Savior. And our confidence is in the future. It's in the present, but it's also in the future. Because we know he holds a future. I love this one hymn uh, in preparation of this. is I am his and he is mine. And here's what it says. Loved with everlasting love. Led by grace with love to know. Gracious spirit from above. Thou hast taught me it is so. Oh, this full and perfect peace. Oh, the transport all divine. In a love which cannot cease. I am his and he is mine. In a love which cannot cease. I am his. And he is mine. The resurrected life is not just one day. It's today. Do you know him as your savior? And if you do, live what you believe by the way you behave. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. May your spirit do the work within each and every one of our hearts. Father, we love you. We know that you're in control. And Father, we have hoped for tomorrow, for we know that you hold tomorrow in your hands. And Father, my my invitation is very brief. First is to those that are believers, and they haven't understood this truth. But they need to begin to remember that the resurrected life is something they live in. It's the newness of life to appropriate the blessings that they have, to the position that they have in Christ. To know that they're joint heirs with Jesus. They're a child of God. So maybe there's someone out there and they've been struggling 
with a thought, th struggling with a situation. And God, you just needed to remind them of this principle of resurrected truth. And Father, how our thoughts need to be rooted in you and not in ourselves and not in our situation. If that's you, I will not embarrass you. But you're going through something right now and you need God's help. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? Put that hand up in the air. Reach up. Just like the woman of faith. She put her hand forth. If I could just reach his garment. My second invitation, you're sitting out there and you do not know Christ is your Savior. But God has given you a gift of faith. And right now, you recognize that you are a sinner and that you need Jesus, his son, the only Savior. And if that's you, would you simply raise your hand? The invitation never ends. I'll not embarrass you, but I will pray for you. If there's anybody under the sound of my voice, I'm not saved, Brother Finley, but I need to be. I, I know what Christ has for me. I've tried to seek in other things, and they just don't satisfy. But Christ will. Anybody? Anybody? Your gracious Heavenly Father, continue to minister to hearts by the preaching and teaching of your word. It's so powerful. We love you and we thank you. We ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.